So I'll go ahead. Uh, so good morning once again, and welcome to the 2022 Georgetown Africa Business Conference. Uh, I will now go ahead and introduce uh, one of our deans uh, who has mentored the team throughout the planning stages, uh, Dr. Catherine Tinsley. So Dean Tinsley is a named professor in the management group at Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business. She's also faculty director of the Georgetown University Women's Leadership Institute, the academic director of Georgetown's McDonough McDonough's Executive Master's in Leadership Program and a Senior Policy Scholar at the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. She has a primary focus on gender intelligent leadership. For three consecutive years, she's, she spoke at the World Economic Forum's annual meeting in Davos, Switzerland, about the role of confidence in women's economic empowerment. Some of her empowerment research has been in the field uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, where she has two projects that point to the importance of mental health and leadership training for improving both psychological and economic well-being. Most importantly, she has been a great mentor to us during the planning of this conference. Thank you, Dr. Tinsley, uh, and Dr. Tinsley, over to you. Thank you very much, Priscilla, for that very generous introduction. Uh, um, on behalf of all of the institutions that I represent, I'd like to welcome all of you from DC and around the world to this seventh conference, which is so successful because of the dedicated work of the students, both in the School of Foreign Service and from the McDonough School of Business. If I could make an analogy of a swan that swims in a lake, you know, it looks very graceful at the top. That's what we do here. And it looks very graceful, but what you don't see is all of the mad work that's going on behind the scenes, pedaling really hard in order to stay afloat. And that's what the students are doing, the students and the staff, but particularly the students have been just so amazing. And so I do wanna make sure that um, we all thank them for their dedication and hard work. Um, and thanks to all of you for tuning in, not just from DC, but from around the world. Amazing to see in the chat where everybody is from. And I wanna um, encourage you because one of the goals of this conference is to increase the um, dialogue and the networking for um, people, for um, both thought leaders in business and policy, as well as um, entrepreneurs and young um, founders, startup founders, with the next generation of students that's really interested in um, commerce, infrastructure, development, and sustainability across Africa. So this is a wonderful opportunity for all of you to connect with each other, uh, to have some dynamic interactions. You're also going to hear from an amazing group of speakers. Um, you can see in the program who they are and where they're from, but what you may not know is that we also have representation from um, the uh, International Finance Corporation, the U.S. Development Finance Corporation, the World Bank, the Milken Institute, Future Africa, the Eurasia Group, the Clayton Christian Institute, Africa 50, um, Andela, Rancard, and on and on and on. And so um, as you are connecting, you may wanna put, as I just see um, somebody's doing, you may wanna put your LinkedIn information in the chat so that people can connect afterwards because that is one of the large, large goals of this conference. Um, this year, as you heard that we are inspired by some of the sustainability goals that have been um, discussed at the UN. And so we're talking about energy transition, um, tech-enabled entrepreneurship, the amazing capacity now with mobile money for um, startups to get off the ground is just leapfrogging the kinds of development um, that is so necessary um, and, and important in Africa. Um, you know, I lived in the Central African Republic for two years, and I've also done extensive traveling through uh, Togo, Ghana, Cameroon, uh, Rwanda, Congo, Burundi, and Kenya. And uh, so I can attest firsthand to the just unparalleled beauty um, and just inescapable potential for development 
um, the sheer size of the continent, the vast resources, and most importantly, the openness of the people, the cultures, the systems. Um, it really makes for a rich, rich area for a, a, a dynamism ready for all of the investment, development, and growth that you guys are bringing to the, um, the continent. And so I guess one more time, I wanna congratulate you for attendance, for your insight, for your foresight to contribute, to make a difference, to create an impact. Um, and I wish you a very a stimulating and energizing, thought-provoking conference. So thank you so much for being here and helping make this a great success. And uh, now I will turn it over to my colleague, Scott Taylor, who also would like to make a few introductory remarks, I believe. Dean Taylor. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, I'm, I'm actually unable to start my video since my hosting uh, privileges were revoked. Awesome. <laughs> so. Okay, Dean Taylor, going to give you that co-hosting right voice. now. I can speak as the disembodied voice. And before you go ahead, I'll start by introducing you. So thank you, Dr. Tinsey. So Scott Taylor is a professor and vice dean for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the School of Foreign Services at Georgetown University. Previously, he served as a director of Georgetown's Africa Studies program, which he led from 2007 to 2020. Prior to joining the Georgetown faculty, he held the Gwaldowin M. Carter leadership in African politics at Smith College. Dr. Taylor's research focuses on issues of governance, political and economic development, and political culture in Africa, and his published works include numerous articles and four books. He has traveled widely throughout the African continent and resided in Zambia and Zimbabwe. Dr. Taylor has consulted extensively on issues of governance, elections, and political economy for bilateral and multilateral development institutions, including the World Bank, African Development Bank, USAID, DIFD, as well as for corporations and nonprofit organizations. He has observed numerous elections in Africa, including Ghana, Liberia, Kenya, Mozambique, Nigeria, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, to name a few, and served as the senior political advisor for the Carter Center's election observation missions in Kenya and Zimbabwe, and on three occasions in Zambia. Prior to his career in academia and African affairs, he was an assistant treasurer in the financial institutions division at the Bank of New York, he serves on several boards, including the Board of Directors for the National Endowment for Democracy, and he is a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, for your mentorship and continued support of this conference. And over to you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, thank you for your, uh, your efforts in putting this conference on today. It's such a pleasure to, to be here with all of you this morning. Can we tell him that he's muted? Am I, am I still muted? I'm not muted. Um, okay, uh, it's such a pleasure to be with you uh, here again this morning. I want to offer, add my welcome to Professor Tinsley's uh, and to Bongiwe and Priscilla's. Um, I, 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 we have done this now, this is the second year virtually. Um, I, I, I was going to say I hope it's the last virtual conference, but uh, to echo Pro Professor Tinsley's point about participants from all over the world and the, the opportunity we have to, to invite people into this conversation from, uh, from the African continent and, and all over the globe is really, really exciting. So I hope next year we can do a hybrid, uh, get back in person for those who can join and, and do uh, a hybrid to invite all of you back. Um, as Bongiwe said, I, I, I served as director of the African Studies Program for a number of years until 2020, and, and in that role, I had the privilege of being involved in the uh, in the very first of these conferences, um, uh, and and worked together uh, with a number of students, including uh, Manish Padyar, who was on the call from Ghana today, who was one of the was the uh, much of the energy behind the initial GTABC conference back in 2016. And it's a real pleasure for me to, to continue to be involved and to be here for the seventh, which is a which is a hugely successful partnership between our two great schools, the McDonough School of Business and the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown, and especially between our students in those schools. Um, as the times have evolved, the, the themes have, have evolved as well. Um, uh, but they've always been very future looking, very sort of uh, embracing of, of Africa's, not only Africa's potential, but Africa's achievements. 
um, in, in business and private sector development and what that can mean for the continent's future. Um, so uh, today we look forward to hearing from a wide array of speakers uh, you know, across a number of sectors. Um, and, and I'm looking forward to some very stimulating discussions and panels and from our keynoters. Um, the aim, of course, as Professor Tinsley suggested, is to provide the platform for discussion, share LinkedIn uh, information, to incubate ideas uh, and to network, but also to understand strategies, projects and businesses, business engagement across the continent that works. Um, and, you know, the, 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 we, of course, this occurs today, um, you know, and, and like last year, confronted mainly with the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, today we still face challenging times, arguably even more challenging times here in the U.S. Uh, with a, uh, a horrible war breaking out in Eastern Europe, um, and, and, and also with some challenges on the African continent, uh, challenges of governance, democracy, uh, exclusion, uh, those remain serious issues. The return of the military coup as a as a tool of political change is is alarming. Uh, that that has become uh, uh, the the vogue in some countries again, and it's something that we have to um, fight very hard against. Um, but you know, the, the the important thing is that I think that um, strong institutions, political leadership, uh, political participation has to be part of our conversation about business because it's an integral part of business success and economic progress. And I say that not just as a political scientist, but I also believe very firmly that stable participatory institutions matter um, for the business climate and for the success of business enterprises. So that's something, as much as we talk about business and private sector development today and all the rich opportunities that are there, these things are so uh, intricately linked um, uh, in Africa as elsewhere. So, I, I, you know, what, what makes me very happy is that African citizens, members of the diaspora, and non-Africans alike, um, have such, uh, you know, a, a role in uplifting this continent and continuing to uplift it. Um, and I see the private sector and, and your, your involvement today is sort of is evidence of this as a, as a fulfilling a vital function uh, in these parlous times of international conflict and, and, and some degree of uncertainty. Um, so one of Georgetown's hallmarks is the power to convene global leaders um, in international politics, diplomacy, law, the nonprofit world, and business, and, and in events like today. So there are considerable strengths in African affairs across the university, um, with the central locus of many of the Afri much of the Africa work being in the SFS's African Studies program, um, gives us a great uh, a platform for talking about a number of these issues and their intersections. Um, and as, a, as the leading school of international affairs, um, my school, the School of Foreign Services, delighted to be able to partner with our great business school and business school colleagues um, in, in everything from uh, our new joint degree program, Bachelor of Science in Business and Global Affairs, uh, to important conferences like this one. Um, so I want to, uh, uh, before I introduce our keynoter, I want to recognize and thank the um, um, those who brought this session to, to fruition, uh, Dean Paul Almeida, the business school, um, my colleague, Kathy Tinsley, who spoke just now, uh, Dean Joel Hellman of the School of Foreign Service, um, and the many sponsors and supporters of this enterprise. Um, we could not, this, you know, the, the degree of difficulty that goes into planning a conference like this um, is, is enormous, even in an online space. Um, and in that spirit, I'm especially grateful to Bungiwa Bongwe and Priscilla Mensa, the two student leaders of this effort, um, who produced the entire conference together with a, a, a huge committee of Georgetown students in both our schools, um, MSB and SFS. And I'm grateful to them, you know, for shepherding this process through, for uh, uh, putting together a great program for everybody today. So I want to also thank everybody, all of you in, in the uh, in the ether uh, for, for coming this morning or this afternoon, this evening, wherever you are in the world um, for this important uh, discussion. So it's now, I, I wanna introduce our, our, our opening keynote speaker, Ralph Mupita, the president and CEO of MTN Group. Uh, Mr. Mupita will be joined in conversation this morning um, with uh, my friend and colleague, Jacqueline Muna Mositwa. Uh, Muna is a lawyer who's represented clients in corporate governance uh, commercial and public law uh, 
across the African continent. She sits on a number of corporate boards, including it as a member of the board uh, of the board of the Bank of Zambia. And she's currently a professor in, in teaching at Georgetown as a professor in the African Studies program. We're delighted to have her uh, and her rich talents as part of our team. She'll be discussing, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, moderating a discussion with um, MTN CEO and President Ralph Mupita, and we are so pleased and privileged to have Mr. Mupita with us this morning. He became CEO of MTN Group in September 2020, having previously served as MTN Group's Chief Financial Officer um, from April 2017. Prior to joining MTN, Mr. Mupita served as CEO for Old Mutual Emerging Markets, where he provided financial service solutions to individuals and corporates across 19 countries in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Under his leadership, uh, the insurance group's emerging market business serviced over 19 million customers, had over 1 trillion rand of assets under management. Ralph Mupita is a seasoned business leader with experience in engineering, construction, financial services, and telecoms. And since joining MTN, he has played a pivotal role in strengthening the group's financial position, its strategy pivot, and successful listing on the Nigerian and Ghanaian stock exchanges. Mr. Mupita serves as non-executive director on several MTN subsidiary boards and as executive director on the International Chamber of Commerce, um, uh, executive board member, sorry, and as a member of the Harvard Business School's Africa Advisory Board. Uh, Mr. Rupita is a commissioner of the United Nations Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development and a champion of the World Economic Forum Edison Alliance. He holds an MBA and Bachelor of Science and Engineering honors degree from the University of Cape Town, and he's an alumnus of the Harvard Business School General Management Program. Please join me in virtually welcoming uh, Mr. Ralph Mupita together with Professor Muno Musitwa to the virtual stage, and thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dean Taylor, and thank you to the organizers. They've put in a lot of effort um, and also a lot of passion and interest to bring the themes of today's discussion together. I think as we have this discussion with Ralph Mupita, some central themes will be coming about. Uh, one is really leadership and his leadership past and what he really wants to see in the future for Africa. Another is around environmental, social, and governance performance on the continent and what role corporations like his play in improving their corporate citizenship. The third will really be dealing with him as the individual, as an African, and the role that an African with so much influence has to impact the lives of young people. And so I'll go ahead and stop there and introduce our student panel as well, because we do have two students who will be participating today. One is Alero and the other is Moses. Alero is Nigerian and uh, she's actually a student of mine, so it's great to be on the panel with her. And Roses, Moses is Ugandan, so it'd also be great to have a Pan-African conversation of some of the themes that they're seeing as students who are um, studying issues related to Africa, technology and development, but also questions from their perspectives coming from different parts of the continent. Without further ado, it'd be great if, um, I can't see on my end if uh, Ralph is on, but up oh, there we go. Great to have you, welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Jacqueline, and a very good afternoon uh, to you from Johannesburg. Yeah, I know for most of you, it's still in the morning, but um, yeah, great to be on this panel and looking forward to the conversation. Well, thank you so much for giving us your time today. It means a lot to all of us to have this opportunity to learn from you and hear more about your experience. I think just to start off the conversation, it would be great to hear a little bit about your background, how you ended up where you are today. And as you go through that, um, just any tidbits of advice for students who are thinking um, about climbing the corporate ladder on the continent. Um, but more importantly, besides you know, what it takes as far as steps in the corporate journey. It would be great to just hear what grounds you, where your North Star is and what really guides you and your impact. Thank you. 
No, Jacqueline, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, it's uh, quite a task uh, to talk about all of that, but uh, we'll do my best. I mean, I often think about us as individuals as uh, always constant works in progress. And so um, I really do uh, you know, appreciate the opportunity to talk to um, you know, people who have a passionate interest in Africa. Um, I was born in Zimbabwe um, in the early 70s, uh, at the time that, um, you know, minority rule was uh, coming to an end. And I was pretty shaped by that experience uh, as a young child, um, you know, understanding a world that had, uh, um, in my view, and I wouldn't have used those words then, but uh, had was iniquitous. You know, you know, black people were seen quite differently from white people. They had uh, less opportunity. Um, but as I was growing up at that time, you know, there was a sense that, you know, if you got a good education, uh, nothing can stop you. Um, and as a young person, I was, you know, really imbued by that, you know, by my parents, the societies I grew up uh, in there in Zimbabwe, where there was a sense that, you know, education can set you free. And once you have a really good education, you know, even though you can live in a world that may be iniquitous, um, there's a lot that you can achieve for yourself and for others. Um, and, um, and, and through that time, there was also a sense of hope and aspirations for the people of Zimbabwe at that stage, uh, that we can be so much more than we are today. Um, you know, why can't a, um, an African be an astronaut? Why can't an African go to the moon? I mean, those things at that stage in the seventies, you know, they weren't seen as, uh, you know, possible, but I grew up under, you know, a, um, a, a, a network or a village um so to speak of people who um you know really believe that we were on the cusp of being the africans who could change uh the shape and destiny uh you know of um, this continent and where this continent absolutely uh, you know ultimately goes and i'll come back to that point you know in, in relation to your question around the north star um i then went i, I left zimbabwe uh, after finishing a levels you know went to, came to south africa uh, to do as uh, my engineering degree, but I've never really left, uh, you know, more than 30 years, uh, 32 years ago. Um, and um, as was said, you know, in the, um, in the CV uh, kind of, um, you know, view, um, I started off in construction, I went into financial services and ultimately in telecommunications. So I've had, you know, kind of, you know, a, a very interesting journey, never being in just one particular sector in business. And, um, and, um, but, taking across, you know, tools of trade, as I'll call it, really around problem solving, but at the heart of it is having a passion for this continent. So to your point around the North Star, um, you know, I'm deeply driven uh, by issues of giving, you know, Africans dignity, uh, issues about uh, the progress of Africa more generally. Um, I'm passionate about this continent, what it stands for, and what the potential and the possibilities of Africans are. And in my current role at uh, MTN, you know, we are a we're a company that is driving, you know, digital and financial inclusion across the continent, trying to serve as many of our 1.4 billion people, you know, with these services to give them dignity and hope and a chance to be able to, uh, you know, better their lives. I mean, those are the things that myself and uh, MTNers wake up to try and do uh, is really this uh, dignity, hope. And we often add uh, also want to give our people a smile. So, yeah, that, you know, th that's pretty much the North Star, this, this idea that, you know, we can make a difference for Africans, uh, driving Africans' uh, progress going forward. Great. No, that was that was that was really helpful. And one, just to understand the fact that, you know, we may think we'll start in one particular place, but we it is possible to switch paths and careers along the way. Two, part of it is our duty. What is our duty to the continent to improve? So thank you for those words. I'll go ahead and pass the mic to Moses. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ralph, for your time. Uh, my name is Moses. Um, so one question that I had for you um, is in regards to like leadership. Uh, you know, from being a CEO of all the mutual emerging markets to now president of MTN, um, you should have a wealth of knowledge about, you know, leadership and I need to just know, like, really um, what lessons, you know, do you think, you know, we can learn from you as young people regarding, you know, leadership, uh, regarding uh, uh, leadership and development and, you know, how we can try to sort of um, take a few that you, that you really uh, learned, you know, along your journey. 
No, Moses, uh, good to meet you, uh, even though virtually um, it's, a, it's a great set of questions. I mean, the whole issue of leadership is obviously, you know, a, a very wide and uh, it's an ongoing journey at the same time. I would say, you know, what I've learned, um, you know, is um, is a sense of firstly developing some, you know, core skill sets that become the anchor of the work that you do. Um, as I said, you know, as, as much as I'm passionate about the progress of Africa and giving Africans uh, dignity and hope, at the core, I have to bring some tools. And my tools, you know, come back from my engineering background where, you know, in engineering, when you strip it down, the, you know, what is it? It's just basically problem solving. You know, whether you're a chemical engineer or a mechanical engineer, you're, you're a problem solver. So I often think about leadership as having, needing a, a, a core of, of capabilities and skills that you can use in the situations that you're in. And I believe every leader generally has some sense of what that core is. And as I said, in, in my view, uh, where I am best is problematic situations and how to figure how to move from a prob uh, problem into a solution space. Uh, I'm best in those sort of situation. So that self-knowledge of, you know, what you can do and can contribute, I think, you know, starts, um, you, know, be, you know, framing, um, you know, the you know, person's ability to grow. The, the, other, the other points that I would raise would be that, um, you know, beyond the skill side is, you know, having a, a real sense of, of, of values and culture or the situations that bring the best out of you from a values and culture perspective. Um, you know, you heard me speak about, you know, wanting to give Africans dignity in the work that we do. So I like to work with teams um, and I, I don't want to achieve success by myself. I'd like to see a collective success coming through. Um, and so when you think about the leadership room, I would add a couple of more points and say, um, things that I've learned uh, in my life is um, open yourself to possibility. Um, don't, be, um, don't be so set in your ways around what your, you know, the future will be. Um, in my life journey, I had a few twists and turns, engineer, financial services, telecommunications. But as I said, I had a core that I took along you know, in, in that journey. But it was important not to fear change. And leaders uh, generally have to deal with change um, because you're taking people to a new situation, a new set of circumstances. So this ability and comfort with change, I think is important. Uh, comfort with ambiguity. The world is never uh, as set as we think it is. Um, um, and there's always something that is ambiguous about the situations and learn to have comfort with that. Um, learn to put people first that you are working with and, um, you know, put yourself last because if you put them first, they'll, you know, they, they, they will carry along and then they have a real sense that um, you care for them. A leadership has to do with caring um, and it has to do also, you know, with setting, um, you know, direction. Um, it, it may seem so obvious, but um, leaders are often asked to go into new situations. And at NTN, we are actually on, on a very interesting journey of change where we are turning ourselves from a traditional telecommunications company into a platform uh, company. Um, and, you know, we are going through that change journey uh, of recreation and reinvention of, 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 of um, um, and I also believe that, you know, at the core, your values must be the things that, you know, really, really, um, you know, enable you to get out of very difficult situations. Um, and then finding people who have similar values to you also is something. So I would argue that those are some of the things that you need to, you know, to look at. I mean, the final point I would raise would be, um, and this has been said before, is, you know, really, really, really put yourselves out of comfort zone to grow as a leader. Um, don't look for comfortable situations um, because you don't grow uh, in comfort. You've got to put yourself out a, a little bit to, you know, to learn and grow. And, um, you know, these things are, in my view, some of the essence points of leadership. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Wow, for that. Yeah. Appreciate it. Appreciate it, Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, I mean, so, so many points there. And I think, uh, you know, as a professor at Georgetown, I think one thing that I'm at least especially proud to be contributing to my class is really around problem solving skills and really helping them think through any situation and come up with solutions. So thank you for your list and especially emphasizing problem solving skills. On that note, I'll pass the mic to Alero, who has a question. 
Good morning, Mr. Rolf. My name is Alara Oindala. I'm currently an undergraduate senior at Georgetown, double majoring in French and economics. I'm personally very inspired by your life story and all your accomplishments. As a young African woman who's currently studying in the United States and hopes to be a leader one day back home, I would like to know more about how you navigate your career on the continent. Specifically, if you could share what has been your greatest leadership challenge to your personal values. Great to meet you, Helera, and uh, uh, wishing you the best in your program that uh, you're, you're taking on. No, look, I mean, um, the, the continent, as I said, is a, is a, is a place that I have uh, a passion uh, for. I enjoy traveling with them in South Africa. I'm in Nigeria, Ghana, Benin, uh, you name them. I really feel at home on the continent. Um, and, you know, obviously these are very different countries and you can't uh, say, um, you know, what works well in South Africa is going to work well in Rwanda or... But what I've seen works well from a leadership perspective on the continent um, um, is for people to know that you, you, you care for them um, and you want to see their situation uh, progress um, and you want to be a problem solver. Uh, coming back to the problem solving, uh, um, you know, if, if you arrive, you know, in Ghana and you're having a discussion, you know, with the Minister of Finance, he wants to understand that what MTN is bringing, what you're bringing, is trying to find, a, you know, a solution for a set of situations that might be holding back the country. So the posture and your um, uh, demeanor uh, also is important. I, I find that um, people want to know that um, from, a, from a values perspective, that you genuinely understand where they are coming from. So, you know, beyond appearing as a leader in a way that um, you're, you're able to be seen as somebody who's solving, uh, you know, um, or, or supporting in um, resolving certain situations. I think what people also want to experience from you is that you come across as somebody deeply caring and humble. Uh, so arrogance doesn't do well on the continent. The type A type of personality doesn't uh, travel too well uh, on the continent. Um, and you can understand that because people are coming from very fairly recently situations of being colonized. Um, and so the appearance, you know, of humility, of, you know, positioning yourself as, you know, I feel your issues and I'm going to help you, you know, goes really well. Um, when I travel to a country, I always make sure that I understand what is going on in the country way and beyond my own business. So I cannot arrive in, in Accra thinking about uh, just MTN issues. I want to understand the Ghana Case program that uh, the president uh, and, and the government is trying to drive. Because if I, if I really understand, I can then intersect what MTN is doing with what's happening in Ghana. And we can find each other in terms of, you know, this belief that we have at MTN that we're driving, you know, um, the um, delivering digital uh, solutions for the progress of the continent. So, you know, a deep insight of people's or country, nation state situations will enable you to be a more successful leader. You genuinely need to love the continent and the challenges that it has. There are plenty of challenges, infrastructure, uh, skill sets, uh, et cetera. Um, so if you're seen as contributing to the solution, um, you will do well um, and you'll be well understood and your business and the corpus that you, that, that you represent I think will be well received. And I think that's a, a real hallmark of MTN uh, and uh, the leaders that we have you know, on the continent. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, th I think we're gonna shift focus a bit from you, know, you the individual and your leadership um, to some of the themes that you're experiencing um, running MTN. Um, and an area that I'm working on by day is around ESG and some of the changing conversations, but also increasingly the changing policy frameworks of really how to manage our environmental contributions moving forward and also, you know, factoring social and governance issues. So I guess from your perspective, you know, there are pressures from investors, customers, governments. Um, for corporations to authentically deliver on ESG performance. 
Can you share a little bit more about what MTN is doing within the space, how you're demonstrating shared value and the impact in the communities that you're working in? Obviously, providing digital services and digital financial services is a, you know, a great step as far as reducing you know, vulnerability, but it would be great to just hear how you're incorporating these principles of sustainability uh, for the company, but most importantly, for the customers that you're working with. Oh, thanks very much. Thanks very much, uh, Jackie. And, um, you know, from MTN, we have uh, creating shared value as a strategic pillar for the group. Uh, we understand that that is absolutely essential for our sustainability and society more generally. So we broke, um, you know, as you say, investors are increasingly focused um, on using the ESG as a primary filter for their investment decisions. Uh, in a previous life, when I was at Old Mutual, uh, you know, obviously, uh, we had an asset management business and um, we would uh, make investment decision uh, predominantly on the financial returns we expected from that uh, investment decision. And ESG criteria was a secondary issue. But the world has changed today that, and that has flipped that where ESG is, is actually a primary filter. And if you can't pass the ESG filter, there's no investment case uh, in for a lot of investors. And the shift is actually growing. So we, at MTN, we've developed a very comprehensive ESG framework um, where we are really zoning in on a couple of areas where we think we can have impact. So on the environmental side, um, you know, we've, um, you know, um, you know, we've made our commitments uh, to net zero. Um, so we are, we are driving our whole organization to get to uh, net zero uh, by 2040. Um, you know, obviously we have base stations that uh, transmits um, the frequencies for your wireless communication and um, the financial services that we deliver di digitally. Now, those uh, base stations, um, you know, are using uh, predominantly diesel. I mean, we don't have in many of our markets, you know, a the perfect, you know, grid system that generates, um, you know, electricity and can be relied upon. So there's a lot of diesel usage, but we have made the commitment you know, with, you know, uh, partners in the value chain, so tell companies that we work with, that we are asking them to commit to our same commitment. So when we say net zero by 2040, if they manage our towers um, and the power consumption of those towers, they must meet the same target as we, because they're, they're part of our scope three emissions as in MTA. And our scope three uh, emissions are the largest, uh, you know, quantum of emissions that we have, you know, within our e ecosystem, so to speak. So a, a huge focus around um, you know uh, carbon uh, decarbonization efforts of our of our of the value chains that uh, you know we are in um, and uh, you know focus also on scope two scope three emissions we've, we're focusing on water as well uh, so uh, water and waste management are the other areas under under the e pillar that we are focused but the big issue is what we call the project uh, uh, project zero uh, which is our in our efforts to 2040, um, you know, carbon neutrality. On the S, um, you know, we're also trying to be well arranged um, and aligned to the business that we're in. So we're focusing on a couple of themes. The first is rural broadband. We can't be providing digital and financial services only to those who have. So we've committed ourselves to providing um, rural broadband coverage uh, across all our markets so that we have at least 90%, um, you know, coverage of our networks. Um, in the rural area, everybody in the rural areas, nine out of 10 people in the rural areas should be able to have an MTN signal. Um, obviously in the urban areas uh, where monetization of the network is much easier, you know that those coverage um, you know, ambitions have already been met. So we do have a rural broadband uh, set of initiatives around, um, you know, around all our markets. Um, the other pillar of S that we have is diversity and inclusion. Uh, and obviously, diversity and inclusion has got many aspects. We focused on women because we realized that in our sector and in our business, in, and uh, we, we only have 38% uh, of the leadership is, 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 is women. Um, and in some markets, we're already at 50 in South Africa. But, you know, in, other, in another market, uh, like in South Sudan, uh, we'll, be at a, you know, we'll be way under 20%. So we, we're taking a very deliberate challenge to get to 50%, you know, um, women within our organization at the exec level and the board level. Um, and, um, you know, we are linking, you know, you know, these actually to our short and long-term incentives that uh, as we hire, we hire consciously that we want to be uh, bringing more women. And we have programs, women in tech, 
um, and you know um, programs affiliated to universities as well. And then the third pillar on under S is the cost to communicate. We need to be lowering the cost to communicate. And the last couple of years, you know, the, the price of one gig of data has been coming down by about twenty five to thirty percent. So, you know, if, if we see that kind of price devolution, more and more people will be able to afford. And then obviously there is the G, governance, um, and, and obviously the governance structures around our company um, and uh, digital human rights. These are the areas that we are we're obviously also focusing on. But um, in, in, in all these uh, structures, um, you know, we are arranging ourselves um, as a company to be able to deliver on these, uh, because we think that uh, it's important for our sustainability as a company to be seen to be, you know, creating shared value, um, you know, with all, with society more broadly, with all our stakeholders, not just for shareholders. Thank you for that. That was really interesting, especially, I mean, one point that I'm especially passionate about, which is diversity and leadership. And so thank you for highlighting that you're working on those numbers at the executive as well as the board level. Um, I'll go ahead and pass on to Alero um, so she can ask a question. Yeah, so I'm kind of curious, um, AI, big data, and the Internet of Things are really changing the rules and service delivery and value capture models, thereby creating business model disruption. And I really commend MTN with its response to such disruptions through your digitization efforts, so, um, efforts, efficiency, and productivity um, with your new business verticals, such as Music Time, Ioba, Momo, and the likes. Um, but my question is, what is your plan to bring all these different businesses into a single entity if you really want to compete with global tech companies? Great question, um, Alero. <laughs> the strategy we own as MTN, which we have labeled Ambition 2025, um, is, is, um, is, is, is based on the recognition that um, the company is growing uh, beyond the realm of just telecommunications. For sure, our revenue is predominantly coming from telecommunication services that we provide to individuals and corporates. Um, but increasingly, uh, it's the digital services that are um, beginning to, um, you know, be the, the growth drivers, um, you know, for, for the business, being the business for the future. So actually, our strategy is to be actually structurally separate, uh, you know, some of the components of the business and create these businesses standalone rather than to bring them under one structure. We think that's the right strategy because if you bring it under one overall entity, you lose the agility and the resilience uh, to remain relevant, to be able to execute uh, at pace that some of the smaller businesses. Um, so as an example, we are, we are on track to be carving out our mobile money business. Um, um, we, we, we use the word fintech uh, as well. Uh, so we're carving out that business out of the traditional telecommunications business because that business moves at a very different speed to the core telecommunications business. So we want to re resource it appropriately. It will have its own, um, you know, standalone set of accounts, its own resources, its own strategy over time. And we let that business, um, you know, um, be, be, be spun out ultimately from the telecommunications business. So our strategy isn't actually to bring things together. It's actually to separate them. Um, and um, because the resourcing, the speed of execution, uh, all of that is quite different. And we don't want the businesses that are moving fast, I mean, to be slowed down by the bigger juggernauts such as the telecommunications business. And our focus right now is to structurally separate the mobile money business. We are also separating our infrastructure assets, um, such as fiber and data centers, because we think that in the future, you will need to be running these business models on an open access basis, as opposed to owning all the assets. So we're going to get investors coming in ultimately owning this infrastructure, which can be sold, uh, you know, actually to other, uh, even to your competitors. You can sell services uh, to your competitors off your own infrastructure. So our strategy is, is actually to be, you know, liberating businesses over time. For sure, they have, a, a, um, they have linkages that are very important and interlocks that are very important because we're leveraging things like distribution, IT systems, but the businesses are very different and ultimately, uh, you know, they will be freed to, uh, in, you know, to chart their own journeys. But for the next uh, three to four years, you know, they'll still be part of a bigger group. Um, but um, we want them to be clearly identified um, as platforms that have actually their own different growth uh, trajectories. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, uh, Moses, your question? Yes, um, my other question uh, is regarding the you know, MTN. And uh, MTN's growth is accelerating growth and development on the African continent. And uh, so what lessons do you think we young people uh, can learn about building such a scalable business like MTN? And um, how, do, how, do you, um, how can we prepare uh, young people to sort of leverage MTN's growth and expansion on the African continent? Yeah, thanks, Moses. Um, you know, MTN's, um, MTN is, was a business born in 1994, the time of democracy here in South Africa. Um, so it's a fairly young business, but what, 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 what sparked its, um, its growth was a belief that there was really a, um, a, a set of services needed uh, to help people communicate um, and actually you know, run businesses you know, with the kind of digital infrastructure um, that was uh, there at that time. Um, and uh, the people who started it, you know, the very entrepreneurial saw an opportunity to provide services because Africans didn't have, fi you know, fixed lines. At the time we started in Nigeria, as an example, um, in, you know, it, it was about 2001. Um, there were only 700,000 fixed lines in Nigeria. But a group of people, uh, you know, went and built a business. And now today as MTN in Nigeria, we have 68 million uh, subscribers. Um, and uh, the business plan then said, you know, you will be lucky if the whole country has 10 million subscribers. And today, you know, the whole country, you know, you have more than 190 million phones in Nigeria. So, you know, the, the, on the African continent, I believe that there are enormous opportunities um, that, um, you know, to create business models around. Um, you know, we're seeing the, the, the online schools beginning to pick up. So COVID actually has created new sets of opportunities for online schools. We're seeing, you know, a shift um, in areas uh, such as agriculture. How do you use technology um, to support people who are on an agro-based industry uh, or even in the rural areas? And there's some very interesting business models that are coming along. I mean, you guys can zip, uh, uh, Google Zipline, which is a business model that was started in Rwanda where they deliver um, uh, uh, blood transfusions to the rural areas. Because the, the roads aren't, uh, you know, always in uh, in a good state, but um, you can get drones that deliver blood, um, and now that and that zipline business is, you know, is beginning to move along. So my sense is that there are enormous sets of opportunities that um, where you harness technology to be able to solve real problems on the African continent and and, and develop a real business model. And to your point about MTN, that's actually is the space that we see ourselves situated in. When we say what we do as MTN is provide digital and financial solutions uh, for Africans, digital and financial inclusions of Africans, and in that space, there you know there there are these opportunities, and and I'm very excited by the level of activity that I see on the continent. You know, you know, obviously a big part of MTN is mobile money, and um, you know, in in a market like uh, Nigeria, you're seeing the the flutter waves, uh, you know, come in. CUDA, you know, uh, OPEI. So there's a lot of innovation going on in the in, in the fintech space, uh, driven by Africans. Uh, so it's very exciting, and for young folk uh, who, who who want to be engaged with the continent and build a business, uh, and that business as as not just an economic uh, uh, outcome but social outcomes. I think there is tremendous amounts of opportunity on the African continent, and uh, certainly from where I'm sitting. Uh, technology is is going to be an important underpin, you know, for the growth of Africa for the next, uh, you know, uh, you know, three, you know, three decades, if not more. Thank you so much, um, Sarah, for that response. Thank you so much. I think just jumping on your point of COVID nineteen and how it's changed our, you know, the way we operate. Um, and the result of, you know, some new and interesting business models. I'd love to hear about your experience um, growing a business during the COVID pandemic and any lessons that, you know, we might learn from that. Obviously, you know, no one expected it, but I think you've done considerably well. You're continuing to grow um, despite some of the challenges. So it'd be great to hear just some of what you've experienced in the past two years and some of the lessons learned. Yeah, as you said, um, you know, 
um, March 2020 was a, a surprise for all of us when our lives and livelihoods were upturned by, um, you know, you know the, the first strains um, of uh, COVID-19 at that stage. Um, we were lucky as MTN that we had been consistently investing in our networks. Uh, so when um, when there were the lockdown arrangements uh, in, in some of the countries that we operate in, certainly South Africa, people weren't going to work or working, you know, from home. Um, you know, because we had in, invested, um, we were able to carry the, um, the huge uh, surge of data traffic back onto networks as people were now predominantly working from home. So we, we saw data traffic grow up 90, 70 to 90 percent uh, immediately. But we were lucky that our networks could carry that kind of load uh, because we had invested ahead. Um, I mean, over the last two years, we've learned a lot about uh, ourselves, society, um, you know, more broadly. Um, and the, the things that I would, um, you know, point out to um, firstly was what COVID-19 shone a light on was the iniquities in our society that we had not seen as, um, as starkly. That there is a digital underclass across the African continent where people, you know, who really don't have access to digital infrastructure and services, they were literally um, as if they were not on the same planet uh, or the same countries we were in. I mean, to use an example, Uganda, um, schools were closed for almost two years in Uganda uh, because, you know, they, it, they had not been as big a, a role around, uh, you know, um, um, but, you know, digitally including, you know, people in the rural areas, focusing on, on, on rural broadband coverage and uh, issues of that nature. So the first thing we, we experienced that was to say, well, you know, we can't carry on, you know, operating this way. We have to find um, solutions to, um, you know, the, um, the, the, the rural infrastructure and rural business models that make sense and can make money. And, and as I spoke earlier on, one of our focuses is, is, is uh, rural broadband coverage. So that's an initiative that we're pushing and we're pushing it and we will make commercial returns for sure. Uh, the other thing that, that um, you know, COVID has driven for us, I mean, is this, um, you know, and many companies are there now, um, is um, remote working. So we actually now have a policy where, um, you know, anytime, anywhere work. So we don't expect people to be, you know, coming to the office, you know, every day now. So our expectation is on average, you're at the office three days uh, in a week, other two days, you know, um, and that's on average. I mean, some people will be at the office regularly, some will be less. So we, we found that that can actually work. Um, it has a little bit of a downside in that, um, you know, trying to build culture, you have to think more creatively about how to build culture when people are engaging you. Um, you know, at least 40% virtually as opposed to just seeing them. Um, so, you know, remote working was something that, you know, pre-COVID people would not have uh, embraced. You know, we're embracing it fully. And, uh, you know, some people are going to be working from home pretty much, uh, you know, going forward. And that has a benefit from a cost structure perspective as well. We don't need as much real estate as we thought we would need because, you know, people are hot desking now. Um, other thing that's, that, that's shot up during COVID, um, you know, has been this issue of, um, you know, as people work from home, your cyber resilience becomes a bigger issue. How do you protect your networks? Uh, because people are not, are not always at the office where, you know, your IT systems and your information security arrangements, you know, are, are as perfected as they can be. People are working from home. And how do you think about security within that context? And so cyber security has become such a big issue for the board. Uh, and for the company, it's, it's moved up our risk profile, um, you know, in, in, in that regard. And the other issue that we've, you know, learned through COVID-19 has been, you know, the, we've experienced chipset shortages, uh, you know, given the ge geopolitical, uh, you know, positioning of both the US and kind of China is we've seen, you know, you know quite um, a dramatic drop in, chip, uh, in uh, uh, chipsets that we use in our antennas and our radios, as well as our smart, as well as the phones that our customers are using. And that supply chain disruption has forced us to think more about, you know, how do we, you know, create a resilience in our supply chains um, and have the ability to onshore more of the work than we previously would have offshored. Um, and then the final thing that COVID taught us was that, you know, maybe not so much taught, but reminded us that, um, you know, as a company, you know, we have to, understand that we also have, you know, uh, social responsibilities. Uh, we were approached by the African Union, um, 
you know, January, February last year to make a contribution to, to COVID uh, across the 54 um, African Union member states. And we made our humble contribution to support, you know, um, accessing vaccines for the African continent, which, uh, you know, the, the vaccine uh, equity issues, I think, are well understood. But we, we, we took a stand uh, as a company to say, um, you know, we want to accelerate vaccines coming onto the continent. So a lot has been learned. And um, to your point, you know, we've been able to grow the company uh, during this time. You know, we've improved our growth rates, our returns are better. In our, you know, and, um, you know, we've been able to extract efficiencies. We are moving more and more of our processes digitally online at a pace that we would not have ordinarily thought would have done. You know, some of the things we're doing now, we thought they would happen five years from today. But today it feels, you know, absolutely normal. So the business has transformed, and um, and I think it's much more resilient than it would have been, you know, pre-COVID. I mean, obviously, uh, for those who've lost lives, um, all of us know people who've lost lives or you know become, you know, very sick through COVID. That obviously is a downside, but there has been an upside, which is this digital acceleration and the understanding by governments more broadly about the importance of digital infrastructure and services uh, for for Africa's progress. Thank you so much for that response. Really interesting. And thank you for the contributions you've made around um, COVID relief. I, I'll go ahead and jump to a couple of questions from the audience. I do apologize. We don't have that much more time, so we're not going to get to all of your questions. So I'm just going to try to combine a couple so you can get a flavor of um, what people are interested in. Nigeria is coming up as a big theme in the Q&A section. And um, a question particularly from Olayinka as well as Leroy is, kindly describe MTN's stake in Nigeria. There were reports that Nigeria generated the highest revenue to MTN. However, the issue of political risk, impact of xenophobia between South Africa and Nigeria is at large. Have you been able to resolve this issue or is that still going on? Yes, I mean, MTN, uh, we operate in um, 19 markets, um, of which um, Nigeria is our largest market. You know, we have over 272 million subscribers, of which 68 million of those are in Nigeria. So Nigeria is a really, really big market, uh, you know, for us. Um, and um, and it's, it's growing very strongly. So it does contribute about, um, you know, to earnings, you know, close on to 40%. Uh, of our earnings, you know, come out of Nigeria. It's a big business. South Africa will have 32 million subscribers and, you know, uh, you know, delivers probably about 30% of our earnings. So South Africa and Nigeria are two thirds of the company, uh, you know, pretty much um, when you look at it from an economics perspective. Um, and so, you know, within the context, um, you know, of some of the issues raised, yeah, I mean, there was a time when the xenophobic issues, you know, were, were causing a disquiet, you know, between the two nation states. I think a lot has been done. Um, in improving uh, relationships between the two giant uh, markets of Africa, South Africa and Nigeria. We, as MTN, uh, supported uh, the trip by President of South Africa, uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa. He traveled to Abuja in December last year. We uh, accompanied him as part of a um, binational uh, commission um, and uh, strengthening ties between the two countries. So I think that at a political level, a lot is being done to look to strengthen the relationships uh, between the two countries. President Buhari did um, visit South Africa uh, about two years ago, pre-COVID. And so this was the return uh, visit by President uh, Cyril Ramaphosa to strengthen and, uh, and, and uh, look to improve economic uh, relations uh, between the two countries. I mean, the social issues of xenophobia are, are, are very broad um, and they actually at, at the source of it um, are not just the Nigeria and South Africa issue, it's actually much more broader um, because there are a lot of uh, immigrants in South Africa from across the African continent. Um, and South Africa is quite a challenged economy at the moment. And so you can understand some of the, the social ills. Um, but my, my sense of reading the mood of the government here in South Africa is that there's a sense to deal with these things uh, you know, uh, very constructively. Um, on the issue of MTN um, and its... Um, uh, also, its its position in, within the within the Nigeria society is we've been on a program as MTN Group to sell more of our shares to um, to Nigerian individuals and uh, corporates so that there's much more economic ownership of the company uh, by people in Nigeria. So we've just sold uh, down uh, just on three percent of the company. 
uh, in what we call series one uh, of further localization. So another 6 million Nigerians are directly or indirectly owning shares in MTN Nigeria. So, and that's part of our shared value structure of localizations. Uh, the more people own of the company, the more the company becomes indigenous and feels like a company that, uh, um, you know, is local, even though it's part of a multinational. Um, but I'm very excited about the prospects of Nigeria. Obviously, uh, these are challenging macroeconomic conditions that uh, COVID has brought on. Um, but the contribution of a telecommunications business to, you know, driving growth in the economy is enormous. And we are playing our own role uh, in that regard. Thank you for that. I realize we have one minute left, so I'm not going to push on time too much. I think the last question is kind of much more personal. What are you reading and what are some books you recommend um, our audience reads? At the moment, I'm reading a lot of board papers because I have a, we, we have board meetings starting next week and the week after. Yeah, but I mean, I, I'm, re I'm reading um, a lot of current affairs at the moment. Uh, I must say, I haven't read a book in about a month, so I feel very embarrassed, but I'm keeping up with current affairs, uh, um, you know, obviously. But, um, you know, you know, the, the books that I'm reading are generally around technology and society, the interlinkage between technology and society. Uh, there are quite a few books that, that are out there. Uh, and one, actually, that's been co-authored by, uh, by, um, by Henry Kissinger, um, it talks about AI, AI and society. Um, because what's interesting for me is what is the, you know, wh where, where does this all go to, you know, with um, the, the rapid developments that we see in technology? There's a societal intersection that I think is important. And so that's generally the, the realm of reading that I've been doing more recently. But to your specific question, right now, reading a lot of board papers and board packs. But yeah, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity of being on your platform and uh, virtually engage um, um, with the participants on this platform. Really appreciate it. And thank you so much, Ralph, for your time and your conversation. We will actually be taking all of the questions that have been asked and sending them to your office. So whenever you're done with um, all of the boards, we have a little homework for you and we'll post responses to the conference website. But really on behalf of myself and the rest of the team here at Georgetown, thank you so much for all of your insights and sharing your time with us today. We've learned so much and it's been such a privilege to have this opportunity to spend time with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much and much appreciate and have a good rest, uh, rest of the day. Thank you, you too. Passing over to Bongiwe and the organizers.